Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Zach, for helping me. We're going to have to build a ramp <laughs> going off so everybody can go off without worrying about tripping and falling. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. If you uh, were with us last, Saturday, uh, last Sunday night, uh, we concluded chapter 2, but uh, there were a couple of verses that uh, God really just uh, had me backpedal on. And so I, I want to share those before we go on in chapter 3, because I, I think that God has a word for us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, when you find it and you're physically able, would you stand with me in honor and reverence to the reading of God's word? Just going to read one verse this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for this day and for this time together, Father, and we praise you and thank you for the word of God. And right now, Father, we want to extend our hands toward heaven. We want to receive this word by faith. We want to receive it with humility and brokenness and with joyfulness of heart. It is your word. It is from the mouth of God. It has been inspired by you. It is you, Father. So now, Father, we receive it by faith in the Son of God. That, Father, that you would use this word to bring change, transformation, regeneration, of Christ's likeness in our lives. Now move mightily, Father. We desperately need you. And we pray that you would empower, that you would quicken the heart, and that you would change lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me be seated. I am under conviction and a lot of confidence that many Christians never allow God to live in them the way he intended. Uh, we are too busy being religious, or we have made our plans, and we're just waiting for God to bless our plans. But according to this text, that is biblically wrong. I borrowed my title today from a line out of William Shakespeare's writings. To be or not to be. Uh, I'm convinced that children of God are not choosing to allow God to be who he wants to be in their lives. That's why the church is powerless. That's why the church is no longer a light that is drawing lost people, people in darkness to the church. That's why when many of you invite neighbors and invite friends to come, they have no urgency or no need because they don't see any power and presence of God. Churches are too busy imitating God, playing religion, forming their own ideas of ministry and own ideas of life, and we are no longer living under the presence of Almighty God. So this morning, my question to you is, do you want to be or not want to be who Christ wants you to be? It's not really about you. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not about you. And I say, some of y'all like that because you finally got to tell somebody that for the first time. Especially some of you wives. I've seen your attitude. It's not about you. I've been telling that for years. I can see the attitude. I wonder today, will we, be move, will we be willing to move our selfishness and rebellion and allow Jesus to make us into whatever he desires? 
So I've got four things to share with you today right out of this verse. We're going to uh, exegete the verse. We're going to take it from the original text, and we're going, to, we're going to dissect it today. And I want you to ask your question, to be or not to be? First of all, I want you to look in verse number one that you and I are not the workers of our lives. Look at the first part of that phrase. He says, for we are his workmanship. The phrase we are is in the present tense and it indicates, listen to this, a declaration, which means it's already been established. So in other words, you and I don't get a vote. You and I don't have a say. He says, for we are his workmanship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 and 21, listen to what Paul writes. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, listen to this, which are God's. It's a declaration. Once you and I get saved, God makes it biblically clear. You are not the worker in this plan. But how many of us are running around trying to become like Jesus and we're frustrated, we can't live it, we're not consistent with it, we get frustrated in it, and many times we become hypocritical to those around us for the failure to allow Christ to be who he is. Many of you right now are fighting with God about a biblical truth. Something that God is asking you to present to him, to give over to him, to turn loose that does not reflect his nature, his character, his life. And you're struggling with whether to be obedient, whether to give over, to whether that you can still have it and still be a child of God. Now, I'm not getting many amens, so this must be hurting. Think about your life. What is that sin? What is that thing that you're constantly, constantly dealing with God about? What is it that God's demanding that you turn over, that he's willing to change your life? What is it that's keeping you from being the perfect image of Christ himself? So you still think you have a vote in the matter. You think you still have a say in the matter. You think that you can be saved and still call the shots. But according to the scripture, Paul says, for we are not going to be not someday hope to be, not wish that it might happen. It's a present tense, which means right now you are. It's not a futuristic, when I get to heaven in the by and bys. No, Paul says you are his. Hmm. So you and I are not the workers of our lives, but rather, number two, we're in the hands of a master craftsman. Look what he says here in the text. He says, for we are his workmanship. The word workmanship in the Greek is a word that means a product, a product. And, and the example it gives is a, a fabric. It means that which is made, it means a work. My wife is a seamstress, 
And it amazes me how she can go to the store and she can buy this bolt of cloth, just cloth that just sit there. All it is is cloth. And she can take that cloth and take a pattern and fabricate, make clothing. So the word workmanship here means that it is a thing that is made, it is a product of something built. Notice the next part of the phrase. He says that we are his workmanship created in Christ. The word created there means to make habitable. It means to create. And so once we're saved, Jesus wants to take his life and live it in our lives so that our lives will be his life. He has to inhabit you in order for your life to become his life. He becomes the creator of it. Well, I ask myself a question because I know some of the naysayers. I say, okay, if God is, if I'm his workmanship, if he's coming into my life to create in me himself, is he qualified? Now, wait a minute. You say, ooh, ooh. But as many of you sitting here today, and bless God, the evidence that you won't let Christ live in you is that you don't think he's qualified. You know he's qualified while you're standing in the way. How come you won't just give it over? How come you just don't surrender it? I'm going to give you four scriptural references to Jesus as a master craftsman. Are you ready? Number one is found in Genesis 2-7. And the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of dust of the ground. Before man was, he was dirt. Now, I want you to sit on that just a second. Just put that in, put that little piece, just chew it up for just a moment. Before man was, he was dirt. And yet our God is so powerful that he can take a hand of dirt and speak into the dirt and create a complex thing we call the human body. I started to bring these elements with me today. Just take a pile of dirt and say, this is what your life looks looks like until it's been inhabited by the Creator. It's just dirt. It's dust. He qualifies as the Master Creator. By the way, he took that dirt and spoke to it. He didn't set up a factory. Brother Phil, I love you, but he didn't have an engineering department. (laughs) He didn't have master tradesmen. He within himself is all of those things. Great physician, almighty master creator. So, when the scripture says, for we are his workmanship created, that word created takes on a whole new meaning when you look at him as master creator. Now stay with me, amen? Because we're going somewhere. Number two is found in Jeremiah 18.4. Jeremiah passed by the potter's house, and God told him to take a look. He was going to show him something about himself. And in verse 4 it says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potters. Our lives are like clay, full of stones and imperfections. Clay is useless until it's placed in the potter's hand. 
And the potter begins to apply pressure in order to remove the stones which cause the vessel to crack or be unusable. In the picture, the illustration that God has given Jeremiah, stones are sin. And only the potter knows what he or she is trying to create. We are, we are to be holy and righteous vessels. And only Jesus can create that in us. He is the master designer of your vessel. So when I got saved, my life was like clay. You ever played with clay? I lived in Georgia for a long time. Let me tell you what Georgia's known for, red clay. That stuff, when it gets wet, son, it sticks to you for days. I'm talking about you can try to wash it off, and it still leaves a red tint to your skin. That clay, when you begin to pick it up or get it on your clothes or whatever, it sticks to you. Let me tell you something. That clay is not good for anything until somebody scoops it up and puts it on a wheel and begins in their mind to conform and to shape and to pressure, to remove the stones that will, will cause cracks when it's put into the oven, the heat of life. Hmm. I, I, I'm going to tell you what this means. Not only is he master creator, he's master designer of what he's creating. Uh, I'm, I'm a pastor, and we just had biblical counseling class, and, and we had uh, eight or ten of you folks go through it, and, and you were faithful in doing that, and you learned how to help people with Scripture, learn to deal with their problems. And let me tell you, we got problems. Anybody here today don't have problems? Well, if you don't have problems, your vessel is probably in pretty good shape. But I'd be willing to bet if you put your life under the right temperature, you might find the cracks. Clay is no good. It's just wet and nasty until a potter looks at it and says, I can take that wet, nasty mess that's full of stones, and I begin to shape it and form it and, and turn the wheel, apply the pressure when I need to to get that stone to pop up and to remove itself. And when I'm finished, it's going to be a vessel that will bring honor to the potter. Now, some of you right now are going through what you're going through because the master potter, the master designer is speeding up the pressure. He's applying more pressure. He's trying to bring forth the stones of sin that's marring your life, keeping it from becoming a vessel that will maintain and survive the pressure and heat of life. Well, Manly Beasley says that we all have heavenly sandpaper. You know what sandpaper's for, right? Sand down, remove the imperfections to get to the good grain and to smooth. I got four pieces, five pieces of heavenly sandpaper. Three of them's here today. One lives in North Carolina, the other one's at the house sick. And every one of my kids are a piece of sandpaper that rubs against me. You said, well, wait a minute, you said five. <laughs> well... She's been the greatest sandpaper in my life. <laughs> and I have been in hers too, amen? I'm sandpaper too. And we rub against each other to remove the imperfections of life. The Bible says we are created in him, his good workmanship. So let me tell you what you are as a child of God. You are dirt. You are nothing till God inhabits you as a master creator. And once he inhabits you, you only get a little better because now water is put with the dirt <laughs> in your clay. And now the master designer, he knows exactly what he wants to produce in each 
one of us. And oh, by the way, it's the same vessel, his holiness, his righteousness. That's what it is. It's not different from me as it is Gary or Ron or anybody. All of us were supposed to have the same vessel, the beauty and the glory of his righteousness and his holiness. Number three, not only is he master creator and master designer, Matthew 13, 55 says he's the master builder. Scripture says, is this not the carpenter's son? Jesus' earthly father was a carpenter. And usually in the Jewish way of life, the son would follow the father's trade. So as a young man, Jesus learned how to take wood and build furniture, and homes, things that are needed in life. Jesus is a master carpenter. He's a master builder. And can I tell you what he's building? Mansion. John 14, 2, the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Our lives are like an old piece of wood. And Jesus wants to take our lives and build it into a beautiful mansion of himself. How many of y'all have ever been to Natchez, Mississippi? Aren't there some beautiful antebellum mansions? I lived uh, near Charleston, South Carolina one time. Anybody ever been to Charleston? In Charleston, they have one section of the old city that they've preserved, and those are nothing but antebellum mansions. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to Natchez and when I go to Charleston, here's what I do. I'm intrigued by the design. I'm intrigued by the beauty of each one of those homes. And so as I'm driving through those beautiful, beautiful mansions, I'm inspired. I want to obtain one of those. It's not a coincidence that God says in my Father's house are many mansions. It is meant to be a drawing tool to himself. And so now watch this. God takes every speck of dirt and clay in our life. And his goal is through the Spirit of God to build through confection, confession and repentance. Everybody say confession and repentance. Through confession and repentance to everything Jesus wants to do in your life. When he builds the foundation, he knows the size of your mansion. He knows how much work it's going to take. He knows how many rooms he's going to put. He knows the furniture. He knows everything he wants to create and build in your life that will honor and glorify himself. So when people look at you, they can do you like they do me. They look at me and say, well, there's an old guy that was a drunk. He had a foul mouth. He was mean-spirited, a liar, a manipulator, a cheater. He was all of those things. He wasn't nothing but a piece of old dirt. And he tried to live right. He tried to do right and got a little water mixed with it and became clay. But boy, when Jesus Christ came into my life, he began to take that clay and he began to mold it. He began to shape it. He began to remove the stones. You look at my life now, 31 years later, you see a totally different man. You see somebody that has the image of Christ, the mind of Christ, the tongue of Christ, the attitude of Christ. He's building a mansion. And it's meant to draw people. The Bible says if he be lifted up, he will draw all men nigh unto himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to tell you this morning that if he is the master creator of your life, if he's the master designer of your life, he ought to be building a mansion in your life that draws those to himself. People ought to look at you and say, man, what a difference. Man, what a change. 
Man, her life is beautiful. Man, his life is beautiful. Man, God is building a testimony of himself that can't be denied. So is he the master builder? I know what some of y'all are thinking. Well, Brother Sam, I got saved. I've got the cornerstone. I've got the foundation. Hmm. wonder how many cracks is in your foundation. There is no cracks. Then you ought to have some solid walls. You ought to have some design about you. We ought to be able to look at your life and say, there's where God's working. Look at what God's adding on. Look at the change of that man. Y'all all right? You ought to step back and say, my goodness, my creator, my designer is building. I can see it. I can feel it. I know that I'm being changed into his image. Hmm. Here's the fourth one, found in Hebrews 12, 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our lives are like a blank sheet of paper with no purpose and lifeless until we're in the hands of a master author. <coughs> Only Jesus can be the author of our faith in him and for him. <clears throat> Our lives are supposed to be a great novel of trust and love with him. Hmm. He's the master writer. And oh, by the way, you say, what has he ever written? The number one seller of all times. The only book that lasts through the eternity. Now watch this. How many of you have run over in your mind your past failures and your past difficulties and asked the question, why did I go through that? Some of you may be right now in a new chapter where God's doing a lot of different stuff and it's, it's confusing to you. You're not, you're not, I was listening to Miss Susan and Anita talk a while ago in, 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 in Sunday school, in my Sunday school class, and, and, they, and they made this statement. They felt like they reached a place where they were just in neutral. You know, you know God's about to do something, but you're not really sure what it is God's about to do. Well, that's the best place to be. Because now you're trusting on him to finish the next sentence. You're, you're ready for him to put in the next twist in the plot. You're ready for him to introduce new characters into your life. See, ladies and gentlemen, it's not about the story you want to write that's important. It's the story that God wants to write about himself through you. Here's what we do. We take the pen and we want to write all the story and we just want Jesus to write his name at the bottom of the page. And we're expecting him to bless every decision and choice we make, all the characters and all the plots and all the things that we choose to do in daily living. We just want God's blessing at the end of the day and God, you just sign on the bottom line. The only problem with that is God's not a ghostwriter. He knows exactly what story he wants to write of himself in your life. And only he knows what he wants to write in your life. Brother Johnny taught me this. I heard him use it the other day at a Timothy Barnumus thing I was watching on the Internet. And he taught me this. He said, as a man of God, all you're supposed to do is take a piece of paper and sign at the bottom of the line your name and let God fill in the rest. Well, Brother Sam, what if he put full of, my life full of complications? Don't sweat it. He's the master creator, master designer, master builder. He's going to build faith and character of himself in you. What if he puts me in financial disarray? Master creator, creating trust and a God of provision. What if I have to suffer? 
quoting the scripture, he was the master sufferer for us all. He's already been there, done that, got the T-shirt for it. Hmm. Well, I may not like the story that he's writing. That's why you don't know the purpose and plans God has for your life. You know how many Christians I run into that are still asking the question, why did God save me? What did he save me for? What is my life meant to be? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to I don't know what I'm supposed to I hear Brother Ron and others preach on a, on a hope chest full of stuff, and how do I get those crowns? How do I get all that stuff? I just feel like I have no direction in life. That's because you're the writer. And you're taking your life down roads God never intended you to go. And you're waiting on Him to give you a blessing. You're waiting on Him to give you the answer, to give you revelation. He's not, not His story. He's not obligated. He's not obligated to bless your writing. Yeah, but it's about Him. Well, only he can write about him. You don't qualify. But go back to number one. You're not the worker. Y'all all right? You're the workmanship. You're supposed to be the byproduct of the master craftsman. You're the workmanship of him. It's not you. Y'all all right? Y'all looking at me mean this morning. Well, not only are we not the workers, but the workmanship. We're meant to be good works. Hmm. Look at this next part of that verse. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. The phrase good works translates as follows. The word good means benefit. It means good. It means useful means useful the word work means to work it means to toil it means an occupation deed doing I noticed something about these four elements that we just talked about none of them have substance or usage until they're in the hands of of a master craftsman. Dirt is just dirt. Clay is just clay. Wood is just wood. Paper is just paper. Has no purpose, has no usefulness until it's in the hands of a master craftsman. And by the way, your master craftsman, my master craftsman means them for only one thing, good. Listen to this, something useful. What, for you? For him. Once again, not about you. I wonder how many of us are missing the purpose and plan of God's life, what he really intended to do with your life. I wonder how many of us are squandered so many years because we've been trying to force God to accept our usefulness. God, I can't go to the mission field. I can't afford it. God, I can't be a teacher. I'm dumb. I can't, I can't get wisdom. I can't serve you as a soul winner because I'm bashful or afraid of people. I wonder how many excuses we have used to discredit the good work that God wants to accomplish in us. It's a useful work for his kingdom. You know how many times you do something because it's convenient? Come on now, don't shout me down. You'll be a part of it if it's convenient, if it fits in your time slot or if it fits in your, your financial situation or with your kids or whatever. You'll do things for God based on convenience. I'll tell you what else you'll, you'll, you'll do things for God. It's based on your likes and dislikes. 
It's amazing how many times we'll throw out that's not the will of God for my life. when we haven't even asked the master. We're not sure we're being... Y'all all right? Brother Sam's just trying to help you. I, I, this right here in the text, y'all, I'm exiting, I'm breaking it down for all of us. At the end of the day, I want my life to stand before God and him look at me and say, well done. He can't say well done if you didn't let God do well in you. Brother Ron taught us that you'll be accountable for your actions and your deeds. My life, your life in Christ is meant to be good works, useful for the kingdom of God. Amen. Not my works, not my kingdom. Look at the next part of this phrase. He says... For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Look at this. Which God, who? Prepared beforehand. The word prepared there translates fit up in advance to make ready beforehand. So, so here's what Paul is saying. These good works that you and I are supposed to have in the hands of a master builder, these works were established before we were. Before you ever was, God knew what work He wanted to do in you and through you for His honor, His kingdom, His glory. And He did it before you even existed. Need the evidence? Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, I know some of you are going to quote it. I'm going to give you the NASB, the New American Standard Version, which is the translation closest to, from the original to our language. Listen to what he says. For I know the plans that I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. Now, I found this the other day. Matter of fact, I was, was rattled by this verse when I was listening to Manly Beasley preach on faith. Psalms 139, verse 16. Listen to what it says. Your eyes saw my substance. What? My substance. Wood, paper. Notice what he says. Being yet formed. Which means he saw us before we were ever formed. Now you quote that scripture all the time that God knew you in the mother of your womb before you were in the womb of your mother. This verse says he knew you before your mother. He, he picked your mother. He picked your daddy. He picked the lineage by which you come from. And the Bible says he did that before you was even yet formed. Now listen to what he said. And in your book, they were all written. What? The plans. Purpose. The days fashioned for me. When as yet... They were none. So before you was, God knew as a craftsman what he wanted your life to become. Mm. You've been running around trying to fit it into your religion, your legalism, your selfishness. You've been trying to fit in God's plan to your plan. The only problem is he knew the plan before you were. Before I was. God knew.
Listen to this. I wrote this statement down as I was studying and meditating on this, and it, it, it just struck me. Our lives will not be full and complete until we become his works. Your life will never be full and complete in your own works, your own plans, your own purposes. It is only when you and I reckon ourselves dead and him alive. When you get out of the way and let him fulfill the purpose and plans that he's had before he even formed you. He don't need your help. You don't qualify. You don't know what he planned for your life. Don't well, Sam, I want to know. Get out of the way, and he will do it. You don't have to worry about it. He'll do it. Let me give you the last one. I've got to close. Man, I didn't know if I'd get this far. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch this. We're not the workers. Everybody say, we're not the workers. He's the master craftsman. And he's building good works. Now watch this. Last part of the phrase and we're done. We are to walk in them. He says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, look at this last phrase, that we should walk in them. The word walk here in the Greek text means to make one's way. The Hebrew word that is used that associates with the Greek word, it means to live for. It means life. Listen to this. It means to regulate one's life, to commit oneself. So Paul uses a word here that indicates that once the once we realize that we're not to do the work, that we're in the hands of a master craftsman that only has good works for our lives, we're now to just walk in it, to live in it, to be committed in it. The Bible says we're not our own. We're nothing without the master craftsman's touch. What he creates will become. All I need to do is commit my life now. Not for eternity, but now. Commit my life to the master craftsman. Y'all know I love Paul, and that's one of the reasons I'm preaching. I, I look at the life of Paul, and, and you know what Paul said Paul said he was nothing. The Bible says he referred to himself as the chief of all sinners. He persecuted the church. He killed those that would represent Jesus. He says, woe is me. I am a man. Man, I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve God. Yet God displayed his love for me. He, he saved my soul. And when he saved my soul, he took that old wretched, dirtful, clayful, wasteful life, and he placed it in his hands. He began to shape it and mold it into a beautiful vessel. Two-thirds New Testament written by this vessel. Used of God to give us application. Used of God to impact. Still impacting the kingdom. Thousands of years later. You know what I've not found in the scripture yet with Paul? Is complaining and whining about the work that God did in his life. Paul never complained about getting beat. He didn't whine about them stoning him. He never sat in jail and said, Woe is me. Where is my God? He has allowed them to do this awful thing to me. He never asked the question, why did God leave me shipwrecked, alone, and hurting? 
Why does God allow so many people to hate me? Why did God allow such loneliness in my life? Because I served him. He never stood up and said, man, I sure hate that God's going to end my life through a wicked man named Nero way before it's time. You don't hear Paul writing like that. Matter of fact, here's what you write, hear Paul says. I count it all joy. I'm ready to be poured out as an offering. Hmm. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Paul did not give us the human reaction to the master's plan. He just walked in it. He just lived in it. I mentioned Manly Beasley a lot. Many of you know who he is, and Manly, Manly had a disease. He had four diseases that they could not heal. He lived for 20 years. God sustained him with four terminal, Ill, uh, terminal sicknesses, and God did not allow them to kill him for 20 years. God used him to crisscross this land and to teach people about faith. And every time Bailey, um, uh, Manley would be in the hospital and he was about to die, preachers would come and they would, they would wail and gnash of teeth and cry and say, God, we don't understand why you're allowing Manley to go through this and why is Manley facing this and why is his poor children doing this and why does his wife have to go through this? Why, why, why? And Manley Beasley said, why not? If it's the purpose and plan God has for my life, so be it. And he lived in the trust and the faith and the love of his God to live those 20 years not in regret, not in disdain, but in faith and love of an intimate God. You let us get a headache unexpected. Amen? Amen. Why? Paul never complained about the life that God gave him. I can look back at my life, and you've, you've heard my story, but, I mean, it's a great story because it's his story. Teenage alcoholic, mean-spirited, I mean, just a wicked, vile man, drunk. And how God can take somebody like that and pour grace on him and change his life. And now he gives me the opportunity to invest in so many people who has had addiction or families who face addiction or have had addiction in their life. And, and it amazes me how God can even use somebody like me to, to do that, to effectively do that. It blows me away that this is God's purpose plan. Now, is it aggra aggravating sometimes to work with addicts? Just like it's aggravating to work with you that don't ever have an addiction. Or I'll say this, you won't come clean to yours. You probably got one. You just don't want to come clean of it. Can it be frustrating? Can it be rewarding? Oh, yeah. Can it be discouraging? Oh, every time I get a call that somebody's OD'd, it just rips another part of my heart out. It's like, God, what else could we do? What else could I have done? God, What? I know preachers right now that don't want to deal with folks like that. They're too much time needed, too time consuming. You got to be patient with them. You got to endure with them. They just don't get it. Bless God, just get saved. Well, I wish that worked for the church too. And yes, salvation is the answer for all of us. I look back at my life. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't change one thing. Because God wouldn't allow me to go through the things I did and allow the, the, those stones of sin. How in the world could I help people in marriage 
And how could our marriage be a testimony? What a beautiful mansion of forgiveness and grace and love. What a beautiful mansion that we can, God can use to draw people who struggle in marriage. Are y'all all right? Now, I got a question for you. I got several questions for you, but I got some questions for you. Are you sure that your life is in the hand of the master craftsman? You know how you know you're in the hands of the master craftsman? He's inhabited you with himself. And he's been building. Now, your building may not be complete, amen? But bless God, there ought to be more than just a foundation. There ought to be some walls up. You ought to be able to look back and say, hey, I see some things. Hey, direction of my life is becoming clearer. I understand the things that I went through. I understand the chapters that the Arthur wrote. In order to build this beautiful life of faith in Jesus Christ, you ought to be able to look at the building. They ought to be taking shape. And by the way, they ought to be good work seen. Things that are useful for the kingdom. Not things that people can look at your life and say, hey, that wall don't look square to me. <laughs> you all right? You ever seen one of them run? You look at it and say, oh, that thing don't look that square to that about. Studs ain't lining up. You know, when you find that out, it's when you start hanging the outside and the inside. <laughs> Walls don't match up with the plumbing. Y'all all right? Your building's supposed to be good works. Mm. That you can only attribute to him, master craftsman. You can't take credit for him. Hey, this is the way God built me. I told somebody the other day, I thank God that God didn't make us all the same. Now, we all have the same salvation, but we all have different characteristic personalities and all that. I'm glad. Somebody asked me the other day, said, Brother Sam, don't you feel under the law to wear suits and ties? Nope, sure don't. God made me this way. I tried that junk before. I tried to impress others. Tried to represent what others thought. Y'all all right? Your religious, legalistic idea of what a pastor ought to be? What he ought to look like, sound like. I thank God that he saves old country boys. That I, I just want to represent him more than in my outward clothing. I want to represent him with my outward life. I want people to see Christ and Christ alone. If anybody sees any good work in me, they have to attribute it to Christ, not me. I want them to see the Spirit of God, the character of God, the nature of God. I don't care what's on the outside. It's what's on the inside that's working out. Y'all all right? Well, I like suits and ties. Well, God bless. Wear them. God made you that way. You wired that way. That's fine. Are y'all all right? Bless God, that's okay. I'm not going to put you in my box and don't put me in your box. Done offended some of y'all now. <laughs> How in the world he knew that? I didn't, God did. Not everybody has the same. Come tonight and we'll talk about how God puts us together as a building. Different parts. They're not all the same. Question. To be or not to be? Do you have confidence today the master builder is fulfilling his plan in your life? If not, in just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. You need to come up here and just say, God, I tell you what, I've been writing my own story. I'm taking the, the pen out of my hand. And I'm just giving my life as a blank sheet of paper. 
God, I've had my own religious ideas of, of who you are and what my life ought to resemble. I've been building my own mansion. You need to put your saw down and your hammer down and let him take over. Hey, is your life? You can't, you can't, tell, you can't tell what useful vessel you're going to be if the vessel is marred with stone. You may need to come down here and say, Lord, I've got a lot of stones in the way and my vessel's cracked and got holes in it. I need you to remove the stones as sin. You may be here today and you say, Brother Sam, I don't know the purpose and plans because I've never been inhabited. My life is still like that dirt. When you read Genesis, here's what God did. He spoke man from dirt into mortality, then he breathed in him life. It came from his nostrils. You might be here today and say, Brother Sam, I need life. My life is nothing but a hand of dirt. And I need him to breathe into me his life. Whatever the need today, whatever the need is today, Here's your opportunity to come. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the stillness of the next few moments, Father, would you speak into the lives of your people? Father, if there's anyone here that's been trying to do the work on their own, Father, I pray that they would die to self and come to the master craftsman. Allow you to begin to create in them the person of Christ, the character, the nature of Christ, Mm. Father, we're created for good works. If our lives don't reflect the good works of Christ in us, I pray that you would bring us to our knees. Father, help us to live in them, to walk in them. All the days of our life. Speak now and do a mighty work. In Christ's name we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As sharing begins to play, if God spoke into your heart, you need to make a decision for Christ today. Maybe you realize today you're not being all that he's created you to be. Maybe you're here today and you need to give your life to Christ. Hey, here's a question. Is your life useful for the kingdom? Is he using you? Is he using you?